Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Orthodox Logos. My name is Ian Silver, and today we are celebrating the Theophany Feast, the Blessed Feast, uh, commemorating the baptism of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I wanted to talk about the significance and the importance of holy baptism in the Orthodox Church and also dive into a little bit of an explanation of the Theophany icon itself, why Christ was baptized, and just give a little bit of a background on why these things are so important to us as Orthodox Christians. I wanted to apologize in advance. My landlord has decided to start uh, digging a burn pile right outside again. Perfect timing, he just started. So if you hear any background noise, that's going to be what it's from. Also, I apologize for uh, the raspiness of my voice. I'm still getting over a little bit of a cold or the coof. Who knows? So, yeah, I hope everybody is having a blessed Theophany feast. <clears throat> and uh, Merry Christmas Eve or Merry Christmas to those on the Julian calendar. I believe it's Christmas Eve. I think yesterday was the Eve of the Eve. Uh, make sure you guys smash that like button. Share this with your friends and family. And let's go ahead and get into this. I'm going to start with some reading from... I, I read some from this book yesterday on the Christian Mysteries by Elder Cleopa of Romania. And the first chapter is on Holy Baptism. 
And that's where I got the idea yesterday for um, the symbolism of the number seven because he speaks on the significance of seven quite a bit. And then it just got me thinking. I know I've seen it in the book of Revelation numerous times. So if you haven't checked out that stream that was yesterday, go ahead and check that out. It'll be available on Spotify and Apple and all of that um, probably later tonight or tomorrow as well. So thanks everybody for being here and we're going to go ahead and dive into this. And in this book, there's an inquirer who's asking questions to Elder Cleopa and the elder is giving answers. I think it's an awesome book. I'm almost done with it. I'm a little bit more than halfway through. So we'll start with this. The inquirer asks, I heard some people say that Holy Scripture mentions only two mysteries, baptism and the supper of the Lord and that all others are human inventions, which they cannot accept as legitimate. Furthermore, baptism, they claim, is not a mystery, but only a symbol or symbolic practice, which represents purification from sin. From sin. They say that, simply, faith is strengthened through baptism, that it is merely a pledge one makes that he has repented, or that the act of baptism is like inheritance, a seal of repentance. Purification from sin, however, is not affected by baptism, but by faith, which is sealed and verified through baptism. Faith, and not baptism, ought to be the principle which transforms man into a new being and saves him, as is evident from the words of the angel to Cornelius. Namely, that through faith in which the apostle Peter will tell him he and all his household will be saved. That's Acts 11, verse 14. The same is clear from the words of the Lord Jesus, from the words of the Apostle Paul to the jailer of the Philippians. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Acts 16, verse 31. Consequently, they say, yes, faith is that which brings about salvation, whereas baptism, baptism follows as simply a symbol of, conver of conversion and faith, or as a seal of repentance. So the inquirer is assuming or questioning, you know, is baptism just a symbol? Is it really a, is it really a mystery? Or it, not real, not is it a mystery, but is it really, you know, necessary? Is it really something that saves us? And Elder Cleopa re responds with, Christian baptism is a holy mystery and not a symbol. Inasmuch as the Savior called it a birth from above, on account of the fact that by it man is cleansed from sin and made holy. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. The Apostle Paul calls it newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. By the renewing of the Holy Ghost, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. The Apostle Peter says clearly that baptism is received for the remission of sins, and that it is not simply a symbol or washing of the body, as it appears to some, but it is a true spiritual birth. Baptism, he says, saves, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. 1 Peter 3, 21. Even if nothing had been said regarding baptism, it would be self-evident from the mystery that it is an act of the Holy Spirit, and thus not only a symbol, but a mystery, i.e. a work carried out for us by God through the sanctified water. And then the inquirer asks, not even Christ himself received baptism as a child, but only when he had reached 30 years of age. Since St. John the Baptist baptized only adults, shouldn't we then only bapt accept baptism only when we are of a mature age? Elder Cleopas says, the baptism with which Christ was baptized by John is not the same which we have received, since it did not have the same outcome. That baptism was, baptism was only a baptism of water and not a baptism of water and the Spirit, such as the Christian baptism which was inaugurated by Christ. He was not baptized in order to be cleansed from sin, as is the case with our own baptism, since he was sinless and had no need to repent. The aim of that baptism was one thing. The aim of ours is another. We know that the baptism of water and the Spirit, which came later, is undergone for the remission of sins. Jesus Christ, however, was not baptized with that baptism. To the contrary, Christ was sinless and had no need for such a baptism. 
And then he asks, in that case, why was Christ baptized with the baptism of John? And I'm going to read from that in a moment, but I have another article right here from St. Nicholas Orthodox Church. I'll drop this in the chat and the description. And for those of you that are going to be listening to this later on Spotify, it is going to be a little bit of a visual um, video. I'll be showing the icon here, and that's why you'll see me looking over to this screen to get that ready. That way, if you want to, you can pull up the icon of the Theophany here in a moment, and we'll kind of go over it. As a matter of fact, I'll put it up on the screen right there so we can see. <clears throat> Theophany, why was Christ baptized? concerning holy water. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. This is a homily um, from many years ago from St. Nicholas Orthodox Church. Today we celebrate a day that is called by many names, the baptism of our Lord, Theophany, and it is also called Illumining. We commemorate our Lord's baptism today in the Jordan. Theophany is the appearance of God where indeed the Holy Trinity manifested himself after our Lord's baptism. Why would we call it illumining? It is because through baptism, we are indeed illuminated. God had a plan for man. The primeval, primeval plan was for us to grow in knowledge and in wisdom according to how we could bear it, in purity, without any knowledge of evil at all. But man didn't choose that plan. So God, in his wisdom knowing this, sent his only begotten Son. Salvation is the knowledge of God, but only the pure can know the pure. We can even see this in our daily lives. There are people whom we just don't completely understand. And we know this because we understand that they're somehow more pure and more humble than us. And we think to ourselves, I don't understand how that person can take such abuse from her husband or his son or his co-worker or some other person and be so humble about it. <clears throat> we know people like that. Hopefully there are people that speak about us in those kinds of tones because we are supposed to be a light to the rest of the world. Only the pure can know the pure, but we're dirty and we need purification. And what's more, we don't have any way to become pure. We don't have any way to clean ourselves. We're blackened and we have no way to clean ourselves on our own. And our flesh, what is more, wars against us. Even if we wish to clean ourselves and we don't have the means without God's help, obviously, we cannot. We don't have the strength, the ability, we don't have the knowledge, and we don't have the grace we cannot understand God without Him revealing Himself to us. So, that is why our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came incarnate of a virgin into the midst of us to invigorate us and to make us able to live, and not only that, but also to give us an example. His ministry was twofold. Being God, He taught us all the things that were necessary for our salvation by His example and by how He lived, by how He spoke, and by His demeanor. And he transmitted this faithfully and carefully to his many disciples. And this is only to be found, this mind of Christ is only to be found in the Orthodox faith. And it has been transmitted carefully and perfectly throughout the ages by the Holy Orthodox Church. He showed us, uh, he showed us no, not only by his teachings, but also by how he lived. And he was a man, as well as being God. So he was subject to the things we are subject to, even unto death. So therefore, when he told us to be baptized later on, after his resurrection, his words certainly have weight because he subjected himself to baptism. He was not the kind of leader or the kind of king who would tell the subjects to do something that he wasn't willing to do. In fact, he said to James and John that you cannot drink the cup that I will drink and be baptized with the baptism, baptism I will be baptized with. They could not bear what our Lord bore for us. He will do more for us than he requires of us and expect more of himself. And indeed, that is a principle of leadership. A leader, whether he is a father, a mother, or a priest, an employer, or someone who teaches children such as many of the men in the church, must lead by example. All the men in this church should be teachers of our boys and all of all the women of our girls. And you teach them by being selfless and emptying yourself just as Christ emptied himself. He taught us how to do it and gave us the blueprint on how to do it. To know Christ, we must be like him. You cannot know somebody unless you become like that person. 
person. It is not possible. So our Christian life in the flesh is to try to acquire the virtues, to be a good husbandman, to acquire the Holy Spirit. And um, the priest says, as my patron Saint, Saint Seraphim Sarav said, by fasting, by diligence, by care, by prayers, by weeping, by repentance, by the whole Christian life. That is the whole reason for ascetical exercises. It's not because they're rules to be followed. It's because they are life. A man who sees a way of life that leads to eternal life would be crazy blind not to follow such a life. So our Lord taught us many principles of how to, li of how to live, but the most important aspect of his ministry is that he made us able to live this way. I can tell you many things, and they might be, they might be true about the teaching of the church, but I cannot invigorate you or make you able to live this way. That is only possible through your submission to the God-man Jesus and the All-Holy Trinity, who makes a man able to live. So the God-man, when he preached, preached with authority because he was able to back up his words like nobody else can. Baptism is an image. It's an image of death and of life. The church says it over and over and over again. When we descend into the waters, we die. Our old man with its lusts die in the water. When we ascend out of the waters, we are reborn a new creature. And this is a hard thing to understand. We cannot simply fathom it. We do not know how, how a man is reborn of water and the Spirit. We just know how we are told to begin the Christian life. Baptism is the first mystery. Although perhaps one would say the first mystery is really the incarnation of the Son of God, which made everything else possible. In our life, our entrance into the Christian life is through baptism. Without it, we're not able to progress in the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of God is salvation. But remember, one cannot progress in the knowledge of God without progressing in purity at the same time. We have no armchair theologians in the Orthodox Church. He who is a theologian who studies God lives as God wishes him to live and is enlightened. We have had theologians that have not been able to read or write or even, and this is hard for us in our industrialized society to understand, they might not have even been intelligent as we would think of intelligence nowadays. But they were intelligent in the ways of God because they lived a life in accordance with His grace and commandments. I hope you understand now why our Lord was baptized. There was no need for Him to be baptized. In fact, what does it say after He was baptized? Straight away, He came up out of the water. And to the fathers of the church, this is crystal clear, and therefore to us it will be now too. He came straight away out of the water because he has no sin. In those days, St. John was baptizing for repentance, correct? A baptism of repentance, but not for remission of sins, because he cannot remit sins. But people would, when they came out of the water, um, it says, and how would you like this? Some of you have been baptized in streams that are cold, making a little joke. They were held in the water. They came up part way. Obviously, their head was out of the water, and they confessed their sins right then and there. And then they were released out of the water. That's how it was done. But our Lord had no need to do so. He had no sins to confess. In fact, when he went into the water, the demons fled. If you look at the icon, which we'll get to later, you can see the demons fleeing from the water because they could not bear to be in the same place as the God-man, Jesus Christ. How can anyone stand against the mystery when our Lord endorses it so empathetically? Emphatically, my apologies. And also, if we have an understanding of how water was treated throughout the history of the whole church, now I mean the history of the church from Adam, you know because God had a salvific plan from that time. There is a cute bumper sticker, but it's not true. Founded AD 33, the Orthodox Christian Church. It was reborn and recreated in AD 33, but the plan had been in place since Adam and Eve. And now let's take a look at some of the scriptures um, that we read today. I'll be using the Orthodox Study Bible. Make sure you guys smash that like button. And this is Mark chapter 1, verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
and immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And we see that in the imagery of the icon. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. So we see that immediately coming out of the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And in the imagery, we see the dove and the dove can represent um, a couple, a couple of things. One of the things that the dove represents, you see the light in the icon around the dove and the light is the presence and glory of God. And the, the dove is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we know that the dove um, brought the olive branch after the flood as well. So we see this again, the Holy Spirit showing up and manifesting itself in the baptism of Christ. So that was Mark um, chapter 1, verse 9. The next one we are going to read. Let's see. I believe it's Luke. Let's see. My apologies. I'm trying to find my place. We can just read on a little bit more here. I lost my spot there. So we see that with the dove representing uh, the Holy Spirit and the light bringing the presence and glory of God, we also notice that in the icon, Christ is blessing the water with his right hand. And him being back to baptized also identifies himself with purification. And that is another reason why we take baptism so seriously, because it is not just a symbolism of purification, but it is a mystery of purification. I'm also going to read from another article. I'll put that in the description and in the link as well. This uh, is called Early Church Baptism by Father Jeremy. It's from 2013. And he says, I had a conversation recently with some friends about how many different interpretations there are for baptism these days. Some see it as a nice symbolic act, which we've mentioned, and others as something you're just supposed to do because Jesus said so, and still others as a literal cleansing away of sin. Since there is an ancient Christian document written around 150 AD, which discusses the baptismal process, I decided it would be best to simply let the early church speak for itself. Too often we turn to secondary sources for information when the answers can be found in ancient documents if we know where to look. The author, Justin Martyr, was a pagan turned Christian who was trained in his early years in the Greek philosophical schools of the Roman Empire. And a few interesting things to point out are, is the one being baptized would fast beforehand. Um, I was asked to fast for a week, me and my fiance were, and also some people in the congregation in the church would fast and pray with them as well. And um, the baptism is a Trinitarian baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We also call it uh, illumination. And those who were baptized were not considered saved as maybe uh, the Protestants might say it but illuminated and you are this this i may be uh, wrong about this a little bit but i was told you're newly illumined for the first you know i guess i guess until you you sin again <clears throat> but uh you walk up three times with a candle and you wear white for the next three services and you receive communion first and according to just uh just in the apostles taught that baptism is what it meant to be born again and we we see that term being thrown around a lot, once again, with the Protestants, uh, born again, Christian, born again, and, you know, not really fully understanding what that means. So let's start. I'll read. This is from the 61st chapter of Justin Martyr's first apology. He says, I will also relate the manner in which we dedicated ourselves to God when we have been made new through Christ, lest, if we omit this, we seem to be unfair in the explanation we are making. As many are 
as are persuaded and believe that what we teach and say is true and undertake to be able to live accordingly are instructed to pray and to entreat God with fasting for the remission of their sins that are past, we praying and fasting with them. Then they are brought by us where there is water and are regenerated in the same manner in which we were ourselves regenerated. For in the name of the God, the Father, and Lord of the universe, and our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. Then they receive the washing with water. For Christ also said, Unless you are born again, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now that is impossible for those who have been once born to enter into their mother's womb. Mother's wombs is manifest to all. So what they're saying is to be born again. Obviously, you can't be born again uh, physically through your mother's womb, but Christ has made it possible for us to be born again through baptism and through uh, the resurrection. And how those who have sinned and repent shall escape their sins is declared by Isaiah the prophet. As I wrote above, he says, Wash and make yourself clean. Put away the evil of your doings from your souls. Learn to do well. Judge the fatherless and plead for the widow. Maybe it's uh, judge not the fatherless, judge the fatherless and plead for the widow. And come and let us reason together, says the Lord. And though your sins may be as scarlet, I will make them white like wool. And though they may be as crimson, I will make them white as snow. But if re you refuse and rebel, the sword shall devour you, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So we see from St. Justin uh, Martyr, his writings from 150 AD, how important the baptismal process is and what it meant to the early church. So this, this is a little article by a priest named Father Jeremy back from 2013, which had some, some nice points to it as well. And our, our Lord does not tell us to do anything that we are not capable of doing. He does not tell us to do anything in the flesh that we cannot do in the flesh and that he did not already do in the flesh. He fulfilled all of the commandments. He told us that our flesh should become pure. He purified his flesh, and his flesh was always pure. He made his flesh completely invigorated with the Godhead, and indeed that will happen to us because he did it to himself. And he promises us that we will rise from the dead as he did himself, so we are capable. And he commands us to be baptized as he also did it himself. He commands us to forgive as he forgave. And there is nothing, no commandment that the Lord gave that he did not fulfill himself. So now I'm going to read some more from another little article, and then we'll get into the icon and talking about that. So now we see with the Theophany, uh, we bless the water. And immediately upon being baptized, we are enlisted as soldiers, not as conscripts, mind you, but as willing men, willing women, willing to put on the armor of faith and of righteousness. We are willing to fight the good fight because we have stated so, whether it was an, as an infant when our sponsors stated for us, and as we grew to maturity and we learned of the church, or whether it is in the case of most of us, where we spoke for ourselves and agreed to the tenets of the Christian faith before we were thrust down into the water and out of it three times. The church today and yesterday, by the way, blesses water. This is called the Great Blessing, and we see this during the Theophany. And in it, we read amazing passages from the Old Testament about water and its salvific qualities. And then we take this water, we sanctify everything with it. And you should listen closely to the services. They talk about how our Lord cleanses the water, casting out demons from it. And we see this if you've been baptized. You know that before you're baptized, the priest does an exorcism on the water casting out any demons from it, as well as doing the uh, exorcism on you. It's uh, a symbol of making it pure and wholesome, good to drink, to anoint ourselves with, good to bless and sanctify everything with. And we indeed bless and sanctify water because our Lord blessed and sanctified water as well. You should drink this water in the morning with the sign of the cross and also eat a small, pe small piece of Andidero before you eat or drink anything else. <clears throat> And you should also drink this water if there is a temptation or a difficulty in your life. You should anoint yourself with the water. You should sanctify things in your home. I have had the custom of going around all the rooms of my house with a censer, with all the rest of the family carrying candles and singing the Theophany 
hymns to bless everything with holy water on a regular basis. And he says, I do not do this as much as I, I wish. I guess I'm more distracted and busy than I should be, but I see this as a very important task. Anyone can do this. And the demons see the water, even after the water dries on the walls, and you cannot see it. The demons still see it, and you have marked your house as a dwelling place of Christians. So we see that God revealed himself and continues to reveal himself to us, and we are able to understand him as we become more pure. He reveals more of his purity to us, and we ascend like eagles. That is the meaning of theophany. That is the meaning of the illumining. May it be that all are illumined and follow him in all ways. Amen. Okay, so now we will go into some explanations on the icon. I have it pulled up on the screen there for you guys. Let's go ahead and make that a little bigger. So the symbolism of this icon is deep and rich, and there are some things in particular um, that I want to focus on. And the word theophany means revelation of God. Theophany therefore marks the revelation of the Trinitarian nature of God when Jesus Christ himself was baptized. And those who witnessed heard the Father's voice from heaven, saw the Spirit descending upon Jesus, and could see Jesus in the flesh, who God confirmed to be his Son with his voice. So one of the things I want to focus on is that Jesus is almost naked, um, very close to being naked. And is Christ purposely depicted with little or no clothing? And why would that be significant at all? We see that all throughout the creation narratives in Genesis, uh, we see God creating and then saying, it is good. Man and women were created together in God's image. They were both beautiful, and while they lacked physical garments, they were clothed in the glory and the image of and likeness of God. However, when they fell into sin, they hid in shame until brought until God brought them garments of skin to wear, which symbolizes the sinful tendency that now obscures our true nature. Their natural beauty was transformed into an object of shame, and Adam and Eve fell, and with them fell all of creation. While Christ, well, now now we look at this. Um, Jesus represents the second Adam, 1 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians verse 15. In shame and nakedness, Adam hid. Yet Christ comes in his majesty both as God and man, both in glory and nakedness, completely unashamed, representing the beauty of the undefiled human made possible through him. And in uh, subsequent centuries, Christians were often baptized without any clothing, shedding the garments of the old man to die in Christ and to be newly res resurrected in him. But why was Christ baptized if he had no sin? And we've talked about this. Christ was baptized, while Christ was baptized in the Jordan River, it was really the Jordan River and all of creation that was baptized in Christ. And as I said before, we can see that through Christ being baptized, he identifies himself with purification. And then we have um, Canticle 4 of Compline of Theophany states, At thine appearing in the body, the earth was sanctified, the waters blessed, the heaven enlightened, and mankind was set loose from the bitter tyranny of the enemy. We see the beginning of a new creation in Theophany. Things are being set right. Christ has come not only to cleanse and restore mankind, but to adopt us as heirs, into his kingdom. And when we receive his glory, not only are we redeemed, but we draw all of creation with us into the final restoration. That is why creation groans in eager expectation, awaiting the glorification of the children of God. And that's from Romans 8. And at the top, the Holy Spirit is descending upon Jesus as a dove. The Holy Spirit is depicted in a mandalora, and a mandalora is, it's Italian for almond, which describes its shape. It's the blue shape around <clears throat> Christ. The mandalora is the uncreated eternal light of Christ. And in the writings of the Eastern Orthodox mystics, God is often prayerfully experienced as light. This is not simply a pretty bright light. 
It is the same light which filled the apostles with wonder when they witnessed his transfiguration. And we also see um, the Mandalora in uh, Christ's descent into Hades, the resurrection icon as well. It is the light which Christ himself described as the power of the kingdom of God. In Mark 9.1, which we read, Matthew 16.28, Luke 9.27. It is the light that filled the once perpetual darkness of Hades when Christ descended and brought life into the realm of death. It is also the light that is seen when one purifies their heart and mind. And we know, um, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So that is what the, the Mandalora is. And in this manner, the Father using his own pre-eternal and co consubstantial spirit as his finger, crying out and point from heaven, openly declared and proclaimed to all that the one then being baptized by John in the Jordan was his beloved son, while at the same time manifesting his unity with him. That's from uh, St. Gregory Palamas, homily 60, 15. And St. John Chrysostom also emphasizes that the gospels state the heavens were open. The Spirit descends upon us so that we can ascend with Christ and the Spirit to the Father in heaven. For the first time since the fall of mankind, we now see the heavens being opened to us. The angels on the right hand, on the right side, are waiting to attend and dress him, dress him after his baptism is over. And this is another thing that's symbolic of the garments of skin. Uh, for us, when we are baptized, you know, they, we, we're changing clothes be, uh, before we get baptized. We're putting on new garments of skin, symbolizing uh, a, new, a new life as well. St. John the Baptist, while baptizing Jesus, is usually turned away or looking at the Spirit descending upon Christ. This signifies that theophany is about elevating Christ. If this were some sort of race, it would be as if the Old Testament, John the Baptist and all before him, were passing the baton to the New Testament. Jesus Christ, and all of the saints. There is an axe near John the Baptist which reflects his warnings that our lives must bear the fruit of the Spirit or else we will be removed. We cannot get comfortable or spiritually lazy. Jesus is not submerged in the water for creation was baptized in him, not vice versa. <clears throat> Lastly, we see these strange creatures riding fish uh, at the bottom of the icon. One of them, the man, represents the Jordan River and the sea. And we see the fish as well, both fleeing at the sight of something much bigger and greater than themselves entering the water. And as the Psalms say, Psalm 73, 14, Thou did establish the sea by thy might. Thou did break the heads of the dragons in the water. And this is also um, linked to the Theophany the priest prayer. Psalm 76, 15, the waters saw thee, O God, the waters saw thee and were afraid. The abysses were troubled. Psalm 113, 3, the sea beheld and fled. The Jordan turned back. So during this time of year, a beautiful ceremony is carried out and the holy water is prepared um, in each parish. Um, congregants are free to take the holy water home with them, and a portion is kept and used by the church throughout the year. Also, we see that house blessings are completed during uh, the subsequent weeks using holy water prepared during the Feast of Theophany, and it is not unusual to give a small gift to the priest who has blessed um, your home. Many priests, as we know, do not receive a salary or they have a very small salary, and events like this help them uh, help carry them financially through the year. So if that's something that you can do, prayerfully do so for your priest. And you may cook, uh, cook a meal for them as well. And so that will explain, that's an explanation of the icon and why holy baptism is so important. And we see that the paradox that Jesus Christ might be revealed as God through an act of submittal to a mere man, John, is shown very well also in the icon. Though John is baptizing Christ, it is the former who is shown bent over in reverence to the latter. And in other icons, John is shown with his face turned toward heaven and beholding the miracle of the theophany. 
Either way, despite being the baptizer, he is not central in the scene. And like I said, we see the Acts, and the Acts is from Matthew 3, Matthew chapter 3, verse 10. And now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into fire. Present in the icon, this shows that whilst the baptizer must now decrease so Christ may increase, John's teachings and role are not done away with, with now the Holy Trinity has been revealed. On the opposite bank to John the Baptist, angels wait invisibly to receive the newly baptized Christ and clothe him. And once again, we mentioned the garments of skin. And so on the left is the forerunner of Christ, John, with his sermon of repentance, represented by the tree and the axe on the right. The angels wait with reverence to accept the newly revealed Son of God in the middle, the moment of revelation itself. And Jesus Christ, despite being the one submerged in Jordan, in the Jordan River, is shown as though standing up and staring straight at us. His body is depicted as strong and beautiful, as it is understood classically, and in older icons, he is naked. Christ appears almost as wide as the River Jordan itself. Indeed, it is though as it is it is as though Jesus Christ, rather than the river which cuts a swath through the rocky wilderness on either side, it is as though it is Jesus Christ, rather than the river which cuts a swath through the rocky wilderness on either side. So they're saying that rather than um, the imagery of the river cutting through the mountains, it's depicting Christ as the river. And the icon of Theophany, as well as depicting the Holy Trinity, also answers the question of John the Baptist. I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? The answer is in what Jesus does with his hands. While in Western art, um, like some paintings that we see by da Vinci, Jesus is shown as submitting to John's authority, and in Orthodox icons, Christ's hands are not shown in prayer, but in a sign of blessing. Rather than the waters of the Georgian clen Jordan cleansing Christ, it is Christ who cleansed the waters. This is why in the bottom of most Theophany icons, little creatures, as we mentioned, are fleeing from the fle uh, feet of Christ. And this is a reflection of the words of the psalmist regarding the Messiah Christ. The sea saw and fled, the Jordan River turned back. And this... Um, concludes it. This concludes our stream today. This is the depth and how profound the baptism of Christ is and the feast of lights which revealed the Holy Trinity cleanse the waters of baptism so that we, like the fish, fishes shown in the icon, may swim in pure waters. I hope everybody enjoyed this stream. Make sure to smash that like. And I hope everybody continues to have a blessed Theophany, feast, spending it with your friends and family, or attending services if you are so lucky to have them. <coughs> oh, I had one last thing I wanted to read. It says, the, cho the church shows the necessity of baptism for believers in Christ, and it inspires us with a sense of deep gratitude for the illumination and purification of our sinful nature. The church teaches that our salvation and cleansing from sin is possible only by the power of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is necessary to preserve worthily these gifts of the grace of holy baptism, keeping clean this priceless garb. For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3, 27. And today on the Feast of Theophany, um, all foods are permitted, so make sure you thoroughly enjoy it. I hope everybody has, everybody has a blessed day. Thank you for tuning in, and I apologize again uh, for my voice. Still trying to get over this little cold. But I hope everybody has a wonderful day. I don't see any super chats. Um, if anybody wants to donate, I'll throw the link in the chat real quick. But thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed the stream. And I think I might be doing uh, one more tomorrow, and then I'll be back next week. If anybody has any ideas on what I, the stream could be on, toss them my way. I would appreciate that. And uh, God bless. I hope everybody has a great day. David Atkinson, Atkinson says, I hope your landlord doesn't hit a water pipe. No, uh, I did have a water line bust in here the other day. That was fun. 
but I think he's actually done. He started and then stopped, so that was a blessing. But I appreciate everybody. I hope it was uh, edifying and that you learned something. I definitely did. God bless you, and have a wonderful, blessed Theophany Feast. God bless. Amen.